Why did you paint this painting? I painted this painting to juxtapose the older woman, my grandmother, with the knives and their symbolism. Do you understand? Yeah, I, you want to uh, uh, take the, the, the soft human form and, and, and contrast it against the, the hard cold steel. Exactly. Oh. You got it! Oh, thanks, thanks. I don't get it. That's because he doesn't understand it yet. Here we are in the John B. Aird Art Gallery with magnificent art hung all around us on these walls. These are wonderful products of these artists. Much like the, the projects, the papers, the things that your students do in your classrooms or your learners. But behind each one of those projects, behind each one of these pieces of art, is structure, it techniques and strategies. Today we really want to take a look at the structure behind them. Well, actually, even looking at this gallery where all these paintings are hung on these walls, there's structure all around us. This building itself is a structure. Actually, we can take a look at it. So here we are. This is the structure of the building. Those same walls that that art out there is hung on are these walls. It's just like what we do in education. We have our students write papers or, or do projects and they hand in the final product. But behind that final product is structure. On this side of the wall, we see all the ductwork, the conduit, the things that keep this building, well, standing and, and running. That's what we're gonna be taking a look at as we look at this session. Whenever we look at a structure, we first have to look at its three most important and basic elements. We've got parts, functions, and connections. Each one of these elements are always in play when we're dealing with or working with learning, always. We always have to know what those, those objects or those parts are. We always have to know what the jobs, or as we say, functions of each one of those parts are. And most importantly, and most sophisticatedly, we need to know the connections that are made whenever we're learning. Now, to start out, before we start talking about question structure and structures themselves, let's take a look at the most important structure that we use in learning, the brain. Right here, if we look at the back of the brain, that's when we're processing all the information that we're bringing in. What we're seeing, what we're hearing, what we're tasting, what we're smelling, that's what's coming into the brain. But what we really want to do is get it up here in the front of the brain, because that's where thinking happens, up in the prefrontal cortex. That's where that magic of, of information being processed through the process of learning turns into knowledge. Now, has this ever happened to you? You're reading a book, you're reading an entire page, you get to the next page and all of a sudden you say, oh, what was I just reading? You can hear everything, every sound, every word that's being said, but it doesn't mean you're listening. You can say a lot of words and really not be thinking about what you're saying. I've caught myself in that situation a number of times. That's what we're talking about today, questions. We know that when a question is asked, there's a very high probability or a much higher probability of the brain lighting up in those frontal lobes. Where we'll start is the four-step strategy. Now this is based on question structure that we're, we're going to, but this is something that's usable right away in the classroom. Let's take a look at it. The first step is read it. I mean, it seems kind of simple, right? Well, how many times do students just want to get involved in the activity and just start doing things? And they don't even read the question or even listen to the question. And right away they want to ooh, 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 answer it. They want to come up with the answer immediately. What we want to do is put something here in between. Well, usually, what is that? Well, we say, well, I'm going to read a story and I want you to think about it, right? And so there's the student, they're, they're thinking about what they're supposed to be thinking about or they're thinking about what they're thinking about, and it may have nothing to do with the question, with the task, with the activity that you're trying to get across for them for the learning. Well, if that doesn't work, then we say what? <laughs> think harder, right? And if we've already been unsuccessful thinking about it, why not just think harder? Well, we want to replace these two. And the first thing we want to bring in is snap it. We want to take every question and we're going to snap it into two parts. Once we've done that, now we're going to come along and do this thing called match it. We're going to want to take those parts and we're going to want to take it back to the document, to the text, to, to the, the source, and find the information and then answer it. 
Oh, great. Just what I need, another gimmick in the classroom. Four steps, one, two, snap, mat. Every time I turn around, they're putting more stuff on my plate in the classroom. This gimmick, that gimmick, geez, just, whoa. That's because he hasn't looked deeper into the structure. All strategies need to be connected deeply to that structure so it will be effective with the learners. Snap it, match it, and answer it. Those are the things we need to show our students so that they can really think and then answer the questions that we give them. Well, to get started, we need to start with this part right here. Snap it. Snap it is where we need to understand the structure of questions. Knowing that there are these two parts of a question that given and requested, we can now look at questions in a deeper way, like research looks at them. If you look at the research, we find that no two questions are created equal. Some are easy, some are hard. In fact, this is true even regardless of content. Questions like, who, when, why, where, how much. For the four-step strategy to work, we have to understand the structure of all questions. And like we said before, to understand structure, we've got to understand parts, functions, and their connections. So let's start out with parts. What are the parts of all questions? Of every question you've ever asked or any question you'll ever be asked? Well, think about it. Well, here they are. And when we look at any question, there really are two parts. The first part up here, we like to call this the requested. This part down here, we call the given. Any question you'll ever read or hear or write, there'll always be these two parts, the requested and the given. And every time we get a question, what we want to do, like we said before, is snap it. We want to break every question down into those two parts so we know what's given to us and we know what's being requested from us. Now we're gonna take this, the four-step strategy, read it, snap it, match it, answer it, and we're gonna focus on snap it. Let's take an actual question and let's snap it. Let's look at those two parts that are inside, the given and the requested. Who took my fuzzy socks? Who took the fuzzy socks? What does that question give us? What's the given? Well, when we look at it, a nice way to always start out the given is to use the word there. There is, there are, there was, there were. There is a person or there is a character who took the fuzzy socks. That's the information that's given to our learner in this question. Now that we have the given, remember we're snapping the question, we need one more thing. The requested. So what does this question request from us? There's a person who took the fuzzy socks, who is that person? Now when we look at the, the question up here, we see the word who. It's what signals what's being requested from us. If it was why, we want to know the reason. Now when we look at this requested down here, we don't see anything with the fuzzy socks. We're not looking for what color they were, we're not looking for where they were, we're looking for who took them. By snapping a question, we can help them focus, like we said earlier, and think about what's really given and what's really requested. So that's it? I mean, that's all there is of these structures? I mean, it's just that simple? Well, it, it is as simple as that, but there's more to it in terms of depth. I mean, if we really look at what he's talking about in terms of research, that type of requested information really does make questions easier or difficult. Simple questions are, are, are things that are concrete, like, like nouns, person, places, things. That, that's the first type. But then we could make it much harder. We could go down and ask questions like main idea, lesson, theme, pattern, prediction. Those things become much more abstract. And as we turn that, well, let's call it a dial, as we turn that dial up and down from those simple nouns to those abstract conditions, we control the difficulty. All right, so we've read it, we've snapped it. Now we go to match it. Match it, in fact, is, is the cornerstone it's core to any type of learning we do with our students. 
It's how we connect this, the learner from the question to the document or the source or whatever information we think is important for them to be knowledgeable about or to, to have a deeper understanding of. That's what Match It does for it. And there's actually four types. We have locate, cycle, integrate, and generate. Now let's take a look at locate in terms of an actual question. What color was the cowboy's boots? We read it, we go ahead and we snap it. The given is, there's a color of the cowboy boots. We take that information, we match it into this nice story. We're looking for a color, there it is, yellow. It was right there. Now we can answer it. The color, yellow. Now let's take a look at cycle, or as we say with the students, right there. Repeater, repeater, repeater. Well, here's a question. What are the cowboy's three pets? Now we're gonna have to do multiple locates, multiple right there's, that, that's what makes a cycle. Here we go, we snap that question. There are three pets the cowboy has. What are those three pets? And now we go and we look here, here, and here in the document, blah, blah, blah. Ooh, cowboy's pets, and there it is. The ant, the slug, and the pony. That's a right there repeater. We've had to cycle through the document with that given information to find those answers. So now we have locate and cycle. Now before I go on to integrate, I, I wanna make a quick point here. What we see in a lot of tests and we see in a lot of classrooms is, is in, in the upwards of 70% of the questions are locate and cycle. We ask that request question and you can find it right there or right there or there or there or there in the document. Really what we start doing here is playing cognitive fetch with our students. They get the requested, they go find it and bring it back. They don't have to process it in a deep way. It's not forcing them to go too far up here. But that's what happens when we start going into integrate and generate. You absolutely have to go up and think deeply about it. Now let's take a look at integrate. And again, this is where we really start pushing those questions to the front of the brain. Let's look at this question. What word best describes Simon? There is a word that best describes Simon. A requested, what's that word? Now, if we look at this document, kicked the cat, took the baby's rattle, pulled his sister's hair, nowhere in that story is it use a word. But if we take those three pieces of information and put them together, we come up with the idea that maybe Simon is, I don't know, mean. That's what an integrate is. We're pulling that information together and creating something or integrating it with something. Last but definitely not least, like we talked about before, locate, cycle, integrate, and now generate. Let's take a look at an example. Here's a question. Why did you paint this painting? I painted this painting to juxtapose the older woman, my grandmother, with the knives and their symbolism. To generate, you have to be able to locate. You have to be able to cycle. You have to be able to integrate. Generate demands that you have something right up here in your brain to use. We've gone through three of the four steps of the four-step strategy. We read it. We snapped it into those two parts, given and requested, and then we walked through those types of match. Locate, cycle, integrate, generate. The last thing, and maybe the most important thing now that we've thought through it, is answer it. Now, as an educator in the classroom, you're gonna have your students answer it all sorts of different ways. They may be writing a story, they may be writing an essay, they may be writing a full chapter book. The answer is the show. What we wanna make sure with these four steps is they know exactly what you're requesting. That's why we always come back to read it, snap it, match it, and answer it. This has been a brief introduction to structure-based learning. We talked about the strategy, the four steps, read it, snap it, match it, answer. We talked about how each one of those dials helps you gain greater control of questions, which are really making the connections in terms of your students' learning, and how that strategy connects not just the content, but into the real structure of questions. We hope that some of these things we've looked at in a short session will become useful tools to help your learners learn.